give me a moment here. Oops. Okay. Here we go. Okay, there's the link. You can find the PDF at the bottom of the post. Okay, so Psalm 81 has 16 verses, and I believe there were um, there were 16 in the Masoretic text as well. And so, uh, before we begin, let's open by reading through the Psalm. Okay, and we're on page three. In Psalm 81, it says, "For the director of music, according to Gitith of Asaph, sing for joy." To God our strength, shout joyfully to the God of Jacob, raise a song, strike the timbrel, the sweet sounding lyre with the harp, blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our feast day, for it is a statute for Israel and an ordinance of the God of Jacob. He has established it for a testimony in Joseph when he went throughout the land of Egypt. I heard a language that I did not know. I really. I relieved his shoulder of the burden. His hands were freed from the basket. You are called in trouble, and I rescued you. I answered you in the hiding place of thunder. I proved you in at the waters of Mirabah. Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you. O Israel, if you would listen to me, let there be no strange God among you, nor shall you worship any foreign God. I, the Lord, am your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice, and Israel did not obey me. So I gave them over to the stubbornness of their hearts, to walk in their own devices. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would quickly subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. Those who hate the Lord would pretend obedience, pretend obedience to him, and their time of punishment would be forever. But I would feed you with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock. I would satisfy you. Okay, and so that was Psalm 81, verses uh, 1 through 16. And so in this week's study uh, from, from the psalm, it opens and it says, Lem not seach al hagitit le Asaf. And so it's translated as for the director of music according to Gitit of Asaph. And so here again we find, as we found previously, how the Hebrew text is transliterated into English. And when the Hebrew is transliterated into uh, English, it's always a good question to ask why. You know, why is this happening? happening? And, or why did the translators for the English translations um, decide to transliterate this word. And generally, transliteration occurs when a word or a phrase is difficult to translate. And so what does it mean according to Gitith here in, in the psalm, in the Masoretic text? And the Hebrew text says, al ha le asaf, and meaning according to or upon Gitith for Asaph. In Brown Drivers and Briggs lexicon, it states that Gitith means a wine press, and this word is used in three verses in the Tanakh, and I list those verses on page four. You can see here Psalm uh, chapter eight, verse one, Psalm eighty-one, verse one, the Psalm we're looking at, and then Psalm eighty-four, verse one, and it says in Psalm eight, to the chief musician upon Gitith, a Psalm of David, O Lord our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who has thy who has set thy glory above the heavens? And in Psalm eighty one verse one it says to the chief musician upon Gitit, a psalm of Asaph, sing aloud unto God our strength, make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. And in Psalm eighty four, to the chief musician upon Gitit, a psalm for the sons of Korah, how admirable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. Okay, so the Aramaic Targum it states in verse 1, it says, For praise on the lyre that comes from Gath, according to Asaph. And in the Septuagint, it says, For the end, a psalm of Asaph concerning the winepress. So the rabbis in the Targum translate, and they say that this is a praise psalm that comes from Gath. 
And the Septuagint states that this is a psalm of Asaph concerning the wine press. And so the translations seem to be all over the place, at least here in the with regard to the Aramaic and the, and the Greek, the Septuagint, and regarding the meaning of the word gitit. The opening phrase does not provide any insights into why Asaph composed this psalm. And when I looked into the rabbinic literature a little bit and the rabbi, rabbinic commentaries, I found that Rashi states that the phrase upon Gitit is a song that comes from Gath. Radak on Psalm 81, on Psalm ver, chapter 8, verse 1 says, For the chief musician set to Gitit a psalm of David, we have expounded already on Psalm 4, verse 1, that Gitit is a kind of music. And there are those who say that David composed and recited the psalm when he was in Gath, while others say, and Ibn Ezra is the, the other guy, that say that he gave it to the sons of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And this psalm also is a hymn and rendering of praise and thanks to God and recounting of his acts of power. Okay, so... Uh, we find that the the in the rabbinic commentary that uh, Rashi says that it's a form of music, and then that uh, Ibn Ezra he says that it was given as a song to the sons of Obed Edom. So then I, I proceeded to try and find the definition of gitit, and in the Jewish Encyclopedia it states the following. You can see that here on page four. It says that it's a mu musical instrument mentioned in Psalm 8 and then 81 and 84, like the previous verses we had, we had shown. The word is explained by genesis, which is a, an older, uh, uh, what do you call it, lexicon, as meaning striking a striking instrument, but is now generally held to denote a zither. Rashi, following the Targum, derives the name from Gath. And it would then mean fabricated by the people of Gath. He also quotes a Talmudic saying that Gitith is an allusion to Edom, which will be trodden down like a wine press, and combats this view by arguing that the context of the chapter has nothing to do with Edom. Ibn Ezra explains the name Gitith as referring to the fact that the above mentioned Psalms were composed for the sake of the descendants of Edom, Obed Edom, the Gittite, who was a psalmist or who is a Levite. The interpretation also found in the Septuagint that Gitit means to be sung to the tune of the wine presses, you know, whatever that means, right, and um, is ridiculed by Ibn Ezra. So uh, the Jewish encyclopedia on Gitit, and you can find that if you Google that, uh, it basically is saying the same thing as what we find in the rabbinic commentary. So they get their definition from the rabbinic commentaries. But um, as you can see that even in the Jewish encyclopedia, it's kind of all over the place. This, the, the word gitit, you know, to be sung to the tune of a wine press, what? That, does that make sense? I don't even know what that means. But um, to a lar the large degree of variation in the meaning of the words that uh, at the beginning of the psalm, lem not seach, al hagitit le esaf. It's a good reason why the Hebrew text was transliterated into English in the New American Standard translation that we, we're looking at here tonight. And Ibn Ezra comments that Psalm 8 was composed by David on behalf of the sons of Obed-Edom. And Psalm 81, however, was composed by Asaph. And David praises the Lord in Psalm 8 on the manner in which he man, made man a little lower than the angels. And you can find that in Psalm 8, verse 5. And they crowned him with honor and glory. The Lord has given man dominion over God's creation. It may be that Asaph is drawing context from Psalm 8 and the significance of man's position that's given by God according to David's words. And this provides the necessary context for Psalm 81 saying that man, the creation of God, the crown of God's creation and the reason why God gave him his Torah, coupled with Asaph's words saying in Psalm 81 verse 8, Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you. O Israel, if you would listen to me, let there be no strange gods among you, nor shall you worship any foreign god. I 
the Lord am your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. Man is special and is called to be obedient to God's word and be careful to diligently listen and and um, to take care concerning our faith. And the Lord loves us so much that he will admonish us for the purpose of drawing us to teshuva, to repentance, and to turn our lives to his ways for the glory of his name. Now, uh, the psalm opens and it states, it says in verse 1 and 2, Sing for joy to God our strength. Shout joyfully to the God of Jacob. Raise a song. Strike the timbrel, the sweet-sounding lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon, on our feast day, for it is a statute for Israel, an ordinance of the God of Jacob. Okay, so when reading through these couple verses here, it, what uh, really you know stuck out to me was uh, on the significance of the blowing of the shofar. And so the question is, what is the significance of the blowing of the shofar? And the rabbis on this verse on Psalm, uh, where are we at here? On, on these verses in Psalm 80, 81, I uh, have some to say concerning uh, the blowing of the shofar. And Sephorno, Sephorno, he has a following to say, and I quote on page, what page is this? Page 5 from Sephorno on Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24 and part 1. He says, uh, Zechron Teruah, a remembrance of the royal Teruah. When jubilating toward one's king, one employs these blasts on the trumpets or shofars to demonstrate such regard for one's king. Compare Psalm 81 verse 2, stir up jubilation to God our strength, raise a shout. The expression Zicharon is an allusion to the fact that on this date God sits at the throne of justice, remembering the deeds of each one and evaluating them as a judge. And this is why the Talmud in Rosh Hashanah 8 calls on us to recite verse 4 in the above mentioned chapter of Psalms, which reads, Blow the horn on the moon, new moon on the day the moon is veiled on our feast day, is a statute for Israel of ruling of the God of Jacob. On such days we have additional reason to rejoice in the fact that he is our king who inclines toward leniency and is likely to find a to pass this examination of the way we've led our lives in the year just concluded. Isaiah expresses these sentiments in referring to God as for the Lord is our judge and the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. You know, from Isaiah 33, verse 22. Okay, so Sephorno states that the sounding of the shofar is done so for the purpose of demonstrating high regard for one's king, to stir up a jubilation and to raise a shout, and that this alludes to the fact that God sits on the throne of justice sitting as a judge who remembers the deeds of his subjects and evaluates man's deeds. And it's for this reason the rabbis conclude, according to the Talmud Bavli in Rosh Hashanah 8, it says to recite this psalm to blow the shofar. And the blowing of the shofar is performed for the purpose of glorifying God because he is merciful and tends towards leniency and considers our desire to live for him, examining the way in which we live our lives in the previous year. And they quote from Isaiah 33, verse 22, and it says, For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. Now in Psalm chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens, for the mouth of infants and nursing babes, babes you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. Okay, so David in his psalm, it describes the majesty of God in the sense of his ability to create the heavens and the earth. 
and as the one who is able to strengthen the baby who is born to nurse and to survive. And if a baby is not able to nurse, there is nothing man is able to do, the baby will die. However, the Lord is able to do all things. He's able to overcome and succeed where man is not able to. And the idea of God strengthening the babe by reason of his adversaries is the way David describes the Lord causing his people to prosper. The rabbis comment on this psalm in Shalach Bereshit Torah Or 98 saying the following. And uh, they say... The angels themselves admitted this when they quoted as saying in Psalm chapter 8, verse 2, O Lord our God, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your splendor. According to the interpretation of the, Torah, of the Talmud, Shabbat 88, this was said by the ministering angels. The same thought is expressed in Psalm 115, verse 16. The heavens belong to the Lord, by the, but the earth he gave over to man. The earth, referred to the verse, to that verse, is the earth of a higher world in which is, um, and it says in Hebrew, it says Knesset Yisrael is rooted, since the name of God, Adonai, is the root of Israel. I have explained elsewhere that the emanation, the Malchut, is the uppermost part of the physical world beyond which there is only a world of thought. Before creating man, God took dust or raw material from all the various worlds, including parts which to us are known as heaven. And they say, by, for example, Torah and earth. And, okay, it says, let me rephrase that. It says that, that, let me reread that. It says, for all the various worlds, including parts which was known as heaven, which the rabbis refer to as Torah and earth, which the rabbis refer to as Israel. And if we look at this in this vein, both the school of Hillel, the school of Shammai, and the other schools are all quite correct, each group having used the words heaven and earth in different contexts. By comment, my commentary is very similar to that of Rabbi Moshe Cordovero in his treatise in chapter 3. Okay, so the rabbis say that the glory of God covered, or at least in this commentary, the glory of God covered the earth with, and that was his ministering angels. And we find that in the Talmud Bavli in Shabbat 88. And it's important to note that the angel is a reference to a messenger which may also refer to a man coming forth and speaking the word of the living God. And it's interesting that the, then that the one who goes out as a minister for the Lord may be compared to the majestic name of God spreading throughout the earth and his splendor covering the heavens and the earth. And a parallel thought may be to Sephorno's comments on the sounding of the shofar for the purpose of demonstrating high regard for one's king, where the minister goes forth and speaks of the majesty of the name because of his high regard for the Lord. The purpose is to speak of his greatness, his love, and mercy, to stir up jubilation, and to raise a shout for the speaking of his holy word. Now Asaph continues in his psalm, and he says in Psalm 81, verse 5, He established it for a testimony in Joseph when he went throughout the land of Egypt. I heard a language that I did not know. And Okay, so Asaph, is he referring to the shofar as being a testimony? What do you think? Anyone have any thoughts on that? We read in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, it says, And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And John says that, that uh, this is the record, the testimony, the sum of God's testimony is found within the Son. And the rabbis, they interpret the psalm according to the Aramaic Targum. They say, he made it a testimony for Joseph, who did not go near the wife of his master on that day. He went out of the prison and ruled over all the land of Egypt. The tongue I did not know, I have taught and heard. Okay, so um, the rabbis in the Targum draw this back to the time of, of Joseph when he was put in the prison. And Joseph did not sin by laying his hand on his master's wife. 
and a testimony that God gave Joseph. Joseph, he kept him from sinning, and he learned a previously unknown language upon which he became proficient and taught others. The Septuagint states in Psalm 81, verse 5, it says, He made it to be a testimony in Joseph. When he came forth out of the land of Egypt, he heard a language which he understood not. So the Septuagint interprets the testimony as being given when Joseph came forth out of Egypt. The idea is that he was given a testimony of God, the power of his right hand to deliver people from bondage. And in a similar way, or in a similar manner, he provides us with the testimony of his son, Yeshua the Messiah. And notice how John says that this testimony is an eternal life. Though we have not yet attained eternal life, it is a future expectation or hope. So our faith is in the word of the Lord and in Yeshua Messiah, the Messiah for eternal life. And the testimony is in the power of God that changes our lives to live for him, to obey his commandments, and to love one another. Now Asaph, he continues, and he says the following. He says in verse 6, Psalm 81, verse 6, he says, I relieved his shoulder of the burden. His hands were freed from the basket. And in verse 7, You called in trouble, and I rescued you. I answered you in the hiding, hiding place of thunder. I proved or tested you at the waters of Mirabah. Okay, so the relieving of one's shoulder from the burden is directly related to God delivering Israel from the land of bondage. And we read in Numbers chapter 20, verse 15, these were the waters of Mirabah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he was proved holy among them. So the question is, how did the Lord prove the people at Mirabah? Anyone have any thoughts on that? How did the Lord prove or test the people? I guess it would be in other words, tested at Mirabah. The water Mirabah means of strife. And uh, we find this in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, and Numbers chapter 27, verse 14, where the words in Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin, and in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 51, the waters are spoken of as those of Mirabah of Kadesh, where the Lord God revealed his holiness and power and put to silence their evil murmurings against him. As a result, he was sanctified in them all the more, and this by reason that Moshe and Aaron both failed to sanctify him in the eyes of the people. But what they failed to do, he brought to pass without their help. And so the testing of both faith and obedience at Mirabah is a reminder of re repeated unbelief and ingratitude. And this too, this is to be understood by the to mean that we are to be careful not to live in unbelief and with uh, ingratitude in our hearts as a people of God. The Lord rescues us when we call upon him and of this that we, we can be assured, we can be sure of. Now the waters of Mirabah are found within the context of traveling in the wilderness. The people of Israel arrived at Kadesh in the, Zin, in the desert of Zin on the border of the Holy Land where there was no water and the people are thirsty. And as usual, they complain to Moshe about the situation. The people are far from humble and they comment. They say, if only we, have di we had died. And they angrily respond saying, when our brethren died before God, why have you brought the congregation of God to this desert to die here or to die there? We and our cattle why have you taken us out of Egypt only to bring us to this evil place, you know, etc. And so Moshe calls on the Lord God, who instructs him to take the staff and gather the people with Aaron and your brother, and you shall speak to the rock before my eyes, or before their eyes, and it will give its waters. And then when all are assembled before the rock, Moshe addresses the people very harshly and says, Listen, you rebellious one, shall we bring forth water for you from this rock? And so Moshe raises his hand and strikes the rock twice with his staff, and water gushes forth, and the people and their cattle drink. As a result of their actions, God speaks to Moshe and Aaron, saying, 
because you did not believe in me to sanctify me before the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you will not bring this congregation into the land that I have given them. And now Rashi, he points out that the Lord God instructed Moshe to speak to the rock while Moshe struck it. And Rashi's conclusion is that he failed to sanctify me before the eyes of the children of Israel were only speaking to the rock would have been a greater miracle than the striking of the rock. Now Maimonides provides a different explanation saying that Moshe's failure is, what he, is that when he got angry and spoke harshly to the people. When he said, listen, you troublemakers. And Nachmanides, on the other hand, says that Moshe made the mistake by saying to the people, shall we then bring forth water for you from this rock? And so these words of Moshe imply that they extracted the water from the rock rather than the Lord. And as leaders, they were assuming the identity of accomplishment and attributing the water to themselves rather than to the Lord God in heaven. And so how often does this happen today? In the circumstances that occur in our lives, in our lives, what do you think? And Nachmanai supports his argument by citing the opening words where the Lord states, saying, "Because you did not believe in me," which implies that this was a failure of faith rather than a lapse of obedience or a mere surrender to anger. Now Asaph speaks. For the Lord in his psalm, and he says the following, he says in verses 8 through 11, Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you, O Israel, if you would listen to me, and uh, let there be no strange God among you, nor shall you worship any foreign God. I, the Lord, am your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it but my people did not listen to my voice and Israel did not obey me okay so and we know that according to the Masoretic text that listening is synonymous to the Lord admonishing um, well I mean it's synonymous to obeying obedience but here in the psalm listening is synonymous to the Lord admonishing his people and what does it mean to admon to be admonished of God what do you think anyone have any comments on that what do you think that it means to be admonished of God. Now, uh, the Aramaic Targum and the Septuagint translations, they, they have the following to say concerning these, these scriptures. They say in the, in the Targum, In a time of the distre distresses of Egypt, you called and I delivered you. I made you fast in the secret place where my presence is where wheels of fire call out before him. I tested you by the waters of dispute forever. Hear, O my people, and I will bear witness of, for you. O Israel, if you will accept my word, there shall not be among you worshippers of a foreign idol, and you shall not bow down to a profane idol. I am the Lord you, your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open wide your mouth with the words of Torah, and I will fill it with good things. Okay. And in the Septuagint, it translates, it says, hear my, hear my people, and I will speak to thee, O Israel, and I will testify to thee. If thou wilt hearken to me, there shall be no new God in thee, neither shall you worship a strange God. For I am the Lord your God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people hardened, hearkened not to my voice, and Israel gave no heed to me. Okay, so the admonishment comes in the manner of repeating Deuteronomy chapter 12, where it says, "Not serving foreign gods, or serving the Lord God in the way in which the nations serve their gods," and this is brought into the context of the Lord God, who delivered the people out of Egypt. And who would have filled their mouths if they would have had unwavering faith. And note how the rabbis translate the Masoretic text. Saying that the that God made Israel fast in a secret place in his presence. The Lord himself is described as the one who bears witness on behalf of the people. And the only stipulation is that they believe and remain faithful. 
They reiterate the command to not have foreign gods in their midst and to keep the words of Torah on their mouths upon which the Lord will fill their mouths with all good things. And what are the good things the Lord fills us with if we keep the words of the Torah on our lips? Anyone have any thoughts on that? What are the good things the Lord fills us with if we keep the words of Torah on our lips? What do you think? The Psalms are about glorifying God in His Word. And notice how often the Scriptures refer to God's revelation of Torah through Moshe. Yeah, yeah Rahi says life. Eli says joy. Yeah. And the Torah is referred to throughout all of Scripture in the prophets, the writings, and even in the apostolic writings. The idea then is if we want to see wonderful things in our lives according to the scriptures, it's not enough for us to merely just to ask the Lord to um, open our eyes that we might see them. We must also walk in his ways in the same way which Yeshua the Messiah walked in God's ways according to the Torah as we read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. And note, what Ezekiel states in Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 9 to 12. He says, And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations that they are committing here. And so I entered and looked, and behold, every form of creeping things and beasts. I'll scroll up. And detestable things with all the idols of the house of Israel were carved on the wall around, all around. Standing in front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel with Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, standing among them. Each man with his censer in his hand and the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. Then he said... Uh, to me, son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are committing in the dark? Each man in the room of his, car of his carved images. For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Okay, so, you know, what's interesting is that, um, that uh, we find God telling Ezekiel to go into the temple and look at what's going on. And then we find here in verse 12 that he says, you see what the elders of the house of Israel are committing in the dark. Each man in the room of his carved images. Okay, and so it's as if that the um, these each person has created their own little world, their own little set of idols that they, they, um, they worship and they raise up or burn incense to, okay? In Ezekiel, we're told he sees all sorts of detestable things according to the inner sanctuary of a man's heart, the idols that have been erected and the things that a man bows down to. And this is why it is so important for man to walk according to God's ways and why the Lord determined to it to be the way in which we are to live in his Messiah Yeshua, you know, to walk in holiness and to serve God and to um, and to not create idols in our lives that uh, we would bow down to, but to, to bow down to serve the Lord God first, you know, and foremost and uh, to not to have any kind of foreign God in our lives. Now, um, Asaph in his psalm, he concludes, and he says in verse 12 through 16, So I gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart, to walk in their own devices. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would quickly subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their uh, adversaries. Those who hate the Lord would pretend obedience to him. And their time of punishment would be forever. But I would feed you with the finest of the wheat. And with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Okay, so um, the Lord says... Now, you know, what's interesting is that um, you, you see this, this statement, 
the honey from the rock, right? And uh, it just it, it remind, it's such a reminder of that spiritual rock that followed Israel around in the wilderness. And we remember that um, a few years ago, I think, that we had we had studied this spiritual rock that Paul mentions in First Corinthians chapter ten, and this spiritual rock that um, the idea was that. Moshe and Aaron, by the power of God, had given the people water at Mirabah, and then they continued to travel around. We're not told that they were given water, and so the idea is that this rock followed them around, continuing to give them water, because they never complained about water again, right? And um, then Paul drew upon this concept of the spiritual rock as then it as a reference to Yeshua, the Messiah. And here we find Asaph saying the rock with honey. And if we study the Midrash, I remember in the Midrash that it says that the rock was like a honeycomb. And so um, it was really interesting how these these texts kind of tie together. And uh, Asaph here, it just sounds so rabbinic to say, and with honey from the rock I would satisfy you, you know. And um, if that rock is ref a reference to that spiritual rock, you know, that, that's, um, that's a really, really neat connection. And the Lord says that he gave them over in the psalm to the stubbornness of their own heart to walk in their own devices. And notice how this is something the Lord does to a person. The Lord has control over whether a person is given to his stubbornness to walk in his own ways as opposed to to uh, God's ways, and it appears that since the people do not listen to God's word, to His word, to His voice, the Lord gives them over to what they want. On the other hand, there is a difference between the man who struggles with sin and seeking the Lord for help to overcome that sin. And think about, for example, the Moadim as uh, those who reject the idea that God wants us to obey his word and celebrate the Moedim as opposed to the traditions of this world. The Lord will give you over to the stubbornness of the heart and not being able to see the truth for as long as you are unwilling to listen to the voice of God, as long as you are unwilling to listen to what he says in his Torah, in his word, in all of scripture. And the Hebrew text is written in the following way, and it says that I will send them in the serara, uh, okay, serara in Hebrew, and it says that I will send them in the authority or rule of their heart to walk in the counsel of themselves. In Numbers chapter 15, verse 39, it states that you will not go or roam after your own heart and after your eyes. And it is also interesting to compare the phrase Shirirut Lev, which is commonly translation, translated as the imagination of the heart, where the deeper meaning is found in the authority or the rule of the heart, meaning that this is one's choices to do as one pleases. And um, I can... I can I can try and post that. You can see what that what I was trying to say here. But um uh, no, that exceeded the length. I can't post all that stuff. Anyway, okay, so um in many ways unscriptural traditions are idols because tradition is designed to make one feel good. And um I think that one way to determine whether something is an idol in our lives is to examine how unwilling we are to give up a tradition. You know, like like take the Christmas holiday, okay? And how unwilling are you to give up the Christmas holiday? You know, it's it's not biblical. It's not a Moedim. Yeshua would never have celebrated that you know, if we were to walk in his ways, you know, walk in God's ways, you know, in according to the Torah, and walk in the Messiah's ways, um, we we shouldn't be celebrating that holiday. But um, 
I've found that by through discussions with others that it is a significant idol and it's something that just cannot be given up you know and um and so I think that uh, and that was the one thing I was thinking about here while I was writing the psalm study that uh there are many traditions that have today have become very idolatrous you know and um the the way that we can kind of weed that out in our lives is to examine how unwilling we may be to give up give up a particular thing or tradition and this is synonymous to Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 18 and Psalm 71 verse 13 that says that walking in their own counsels and uh, Jeremiah 9 13 etc Job in, in chapter 31 verse 7 it states the for the heart that follows the eye is among the grievous sins being regarded as the head or the gar guiding force of sin. And it says, if my heart hath gone after mine eyes, that's what Job says, which describes the will or the conscience to make choices to sin. And this is the meaning of to walk in the way of your, of your heart, which is synonymous to a man following after his own pleasure. And so, and in the Aramaic Targum on these verses, on these scriptures, it says the following. It says, um, on the conclusion of the psalm, it says, But my people did not receive my voice, and Israel did not want my word. And I expelled them for the thoughts of my heart. They went away in their wicked counsel. Would that my people had listened to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. In a little while, I will humble their enemies and I will turn my strong bow against their enemy armies or their enemies. The enemies of the Lord will be false to him, and their harshness will last forever. But he will feed him with the best of wheat bread, and I will satisfy with with honey from the rock. Okay, and in the Septuagint it says, So I let them go after the ways of their own hearts. They will go on their own ways. If my people had hearkened to me, if Israel had walked in my ways, I should have put down their enemies very quickly and should have laid my hand upon those that afflicted them. The Lord's enemies should have lied, or sorry, should have laid, wait a minute, where am I at here? Okay, yeah, the Lord's enemies should have lied to him, but their time shall be forever. And he fed them with the fat of wheat and satisfied them with the honey out of the rock. Okay, and, and so it's interesting how the rabbis render the Masoretic text. They say that Israel did not listen to God's voice, and that if they had the Lord, if they, if they had listened, the Lord would have removed these thoughts from their hearts, so that they would have walked away from wicked counsels. Notice how the Lord desires for us to walk in His ways, to walk in His footsteps, and He longs for uh, to help us in doing so. And this is consistent with Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. We are God's uh, created or made thing. Therefore, our messianic salvation is not something of our own acquiring, but is a gift of God. And we are called in the Messiah unto good works. Asaph and the rabbis understand this to mean that the Lord works in us a poinema, a made thing, which refers to his ethical and moral creation or that of the new spiritual state of life which causes us to have the desire to draw near to the Lord God in heaven and to his Messiah Yeshua. The concluding verse in Psalm 81 states in verse 16, But I would feed you with the finest of the wheat and with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. This is what God has provided us for us in the Messiah. But we have to want it and to walk or to live accordingly. It is not merely enough for us to ask the Lord God to save us. We are called to walk as a people who are saved and delivered from bondage. Yeshua wants us to walk in God's ways in the same way that he did.
you know, as we read in First John chapter two, verse six. Okay, so that concludes the psalm study for tonight, and uh, so let's conclude with with a prayer, and then I'll open the mic for um, anyone who has any comments. Let me um, give you a second here. One second. Okay. Okay, we'll close over prayer here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of the works of your hands, including the work that you performed in our lives today. Lord, we glorify your holy name. We ask for help and for strength and the resolve to live for you with the confidence to know that you are present in our lives. Lord, I ask that for those those who have lost their loved ones out west, you know, in the shootings and all all the people that are, are going through these, these kinds of horrible times around the world, Lord, that you would you would be with them and that you would Give them the resolve to continue to live for you and as a testimony of the glory of your son, Yeshua, and in how you've worked in their lives. Lord, I ask that you would help us to keep our feet on the path of righteousness and truth according to your word and also to have the desire to walk in your ways. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the faith to believe in Yeshua the Messiah and for always calling our hearts back to you. Please, Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us for our sins. We thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, Yeshua, that we may enter into the covenant of peace that you have promised to your people. Help us to grow in our faith, to walk in the Spirit, and to apply these truths to our lives. We praise your holy name. We give you all the honor and the glory and the praise forever and ever. In Yeshua's name we pray.